All right, go ahead and have a seat. We are glad to see you this morning. Uh, if you somehow do not know me yet, maybe it's your first time here. Uh, my name is Chase Allen. I'm the student pastor here at First Baptist Church, uh, Umatilla. And let me just say, when I say that to people out in public, when I say I'm the student pastor, people think that I'm like a pastor that's like a student under the pastor. So I work with teenagers. So we used to call it youth pastor. Now a lot of times we call it student pastor because it just sounds better, right? And so student pastor here at First Baptist Church, Umatilla, always uh, honored and thankful to, to come and to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, pastor Brooks is okay. So for those of you who are like, maybe your first time here and you were pumped to hear Pastor Brooks, he's fine. He was here in the last service. I made him stand up so everybody could see that his back was okay, that he didn't throw it out again. He's good. Uh, he's just preparing to leave today to go to the Jubilee trip with our senior adults. And so they've got a lot of preparations to make. And so they're doing that. And so uh, we want to pray for them this week as they go. And as they, uh, you know, hear some uh, great worship and some great preaching. And as from what I understand, eat a lot of food. Um, we just want to pray for them that they would have uh, a great time of fellowship and of meeting with the Lord. And so I um, want to real quick, one more commercial before I get to the message. Just want to say thank you to the church. Uh, calls, texts, cards, gifts, uh, whatever in person, just asking how our family is doing. We did have a, a new baby uh, about three weeks ago. Uh, her name's Emery. I know Pastor Brooks showed her picture uh, up on the screen a couple weeks ago. And so just want to thank you for checking in on us, for asking how we're doing. We're doing good. Uh, she actually sleeps fairly well for a newborn baby. We get like those two to sometimes four hour stretches at night. And so just like waking up two or three times a night, which isn't bad, but I will tell you, you notice sometimes maybe just how sleep deprived you are because you say something or you call somebody by the wrong name or do weird stuff. So that's just uh, to let you know that if I say something that sounds weird or off, I've got a newborn baby, so I'm gonna blame the baby, okay? You can do that as a parent. You parents know you use your baby as an escape from things that you don't want to do, so I'm going to use the baby as the excuse if I say something that sounds a little off this morning, okay? But we just want to thank you for that. Uh, both her and uh, Taylor, my wife, are doing great, and so we thank the Lord for that for sure. And so um, I don't know how it happened, but years ago uh, when I first preached here, I showed my socks for some reason, and again, every time I preach, I feel like I have to show them. And so um, sometimes they're old socks that I've recycled through. Um, sometimes they're new ones that I order just because it connects with the beginning of my message or maybe a holiday that's going on or whatever the case may be. So I've got some socks today. Stay with me because you may not, you may not catch it. I think one or two people from the last service knew instantly what they were. So just stay with me, okay? So here's my socks for today. I've got some red and white socks today, all right? And where's Waldo? I heard somebody say it. That was awesome. And it's absolutely for Where's Waldo. I got a little, I got a book for you guys today. This isn't going to be the book that I'm going to preach from, just in case you're, you know, I know I'm the student pastor, but just stay with me. It's all right. Um, last Saturday, I went grocery shopping. I went to Publix, and I hardly ever look at the magazines and the books there at the front of Publix. But as I was walking by, this book, for some reason, caught my eye. And I was like, man, my son Noah would love this book. So I bought it for him, and I took it home, and I gave it to him, and he was excited. He didn't know what it was. Apparently, he lives a very sheltered life, a six-and-a-half-year-old that doesn't know what Where's Waldo is, but he didn't know. So I gave him the book, and I said, look, this is Waldo. Find him. Like, it's, it's simple, man. You just look through the pages, and you just find Waldo. So I gave him the book, and I'm putting the groceries away, and um, I was very disappointed that within 10 minutes, he found all the Waldos on all the pages. Because I was like, listen, listen, I paid $10 for this book, it better last a whole lot longer than 10 minutes, right? And, and so he asked if I wanted to go through and find the Waldos with him, which I agreed to, but seemed very unfair because he's already found all the Waldos. Like, what's the point of me doing it? You know where they are already, right? So we go through the book. We find all the Waldos. It takes about another 10 minutes. And again, I'm like, man, $10. We got to get a little more enjoyment out of this thing. So for any parents or grandparents in the room, I didn't know this. But if you look in the front of the book, I mean, there's like 20 different characters that you can find on the different pages. I mean, there's like girl Waldos, there's a wizard, there's a dog. Did anybody know that there's an evil Waldo that wears black and yellow? Like, I had no idea. I felt like my entire childhood is a lie. I thought all you do is look for Waldo and that's the end game. But there's all these other people. Not only that, but as you go through, there's like um, these little itty bitty black figures. There's like a camera, there's a dog bone, there's a key, and those things are hard to find. So as we did that, it took us more than 10 minutes. It took us a couple of hours to find all the things on all the pages. But what happened is that as my son Noah and I are looking through this book, the question that we had to begin to ask each other was simply this, what are you looking for? 
Because as we're looking at this giant book, and I mean, there's like a lot of stuff on the, there's a lot happening. Like, it'll give you a headache, right? As we're looking at these pages, I wanted to make sure that he wasn't looking for the same thing that I was looking for. Because if he found it, I'd be mad. Like, I want him looking for the bone while I'm looking for the dog, right? Like, I want to make sure we're not looking for the same thing. So the question was so important is what are you looking for? I think it was an important question for us last Saturday, but church, don't miss that. I think it's also an important question for us this morning. What are you looking for? Because here's what I know about people. Everybody is looking for something, right? Like it it may be joy. It, It may be happiness. It may be fulfillment of some type. You may be looking for a spouse. You may be looking to get skinny, Or or you may be looking to get rich, or or maybe both, right? Like, that'd be a good combo, skinny and rich, right? Or maybe you're looking for the next great adventure, or or whatever it may be, everyone is looking for something. And so I began to think, when it comes to the spiritual things in life, what are you looking for? Because church, if there's one thing that I know, it's this, is that in Jesus, I believe that we find everything that we could ever ask for or imagine and more. It's in Jesus that we find all that we need. So this morning, the title of our message is simply this, what are you looking for? If you've got a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And our tech guys must have already had it up there because I don't hear a whole lot of pages turning. Y'all are doing good. All right, so 1 John 2, 1 through 2 is where we're going to be today. And as you're turning there, a little bit of background information for you on the book of 1 John. The author of this book never identifies himself within 1 John. They never say, hey, it's me, John. What's up? This is my book that I wrote, right? Like he never does that, okay? But what we can figure out, what we can deduce is this, is that if you look at the writing styles of 1 2nd and 3rd John, plus the Gospel of John, based on the writing style, we can figure that this most likely was all the same author that wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, plus the Gospel of John, right? And so as we look at the Gospel of John, we see that the author identifies himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wasn't conceited or anything, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved. And then as we look at 2nd and 3rd John, the author describes himself as just simply the elder, Right? And so we have two different titles, but we believe as we look at the writing styles, this was the same person. Most likely we can figure out that this person was John, the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus who wrote this. Now, I've already messed up and called it a letter because we're used to doing that when it comes to the New Testament, right? But this, in all reality, is not really a letter that John wrote. Paul wrote tons of letters, but this isn't necessarily a letter. As you read through the book of 1 John, you'll see that really this reads more like a poetic sermon that he wrote and that he sent And most likely this was sent to a network of house churches in or near the city, the area of Ephesus. We we can most likely figure that out because of this. In Ephesus, there was this network of house churches that had a fraction that took place. There was some friction. There was a split that happened, and a group of people went off on their own, and they kind of did away with some of the beliefs of Christianity. And this is a big deal because of this. They no longer claimed that Jesus was the Messiah or the Son of God. It's kind of a problem when it comes to Christianity, right? And so John writes this poetic sermon to this network of house churches in Ephesus to fix some problems that have arose, to do some damage control, to say, hey, y'all need to get this thing figured out. And so this is who he's writing to and why he is writing. So now that we have that background information, if you're there, 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, says this, my little children... I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. This morning I want to look at three things with you. Three things that we find in Jesus. So number one, if you're a note taker, is we have an advocate. An advocate is number one. We see right there in verse 1, he says, And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. I love that John starts off with chapter 2 here by saying, My little children, as he is addressing his audience. What we can figure out here is if we look at the context of this passage, what's so great is that he's not speaking down to his audience. This, by calling them my little children, this has nothing to do with their age 
or their maturity in Christ. But what this shows us is this shows us a, a connectedness, a, a, a bond between him and the people that he is writing this sermon to. It's kind of like this for the parents or for the grandparents in the room. Maybe you have special names for your children or for your grandchildren, or maybe a special way that you would say their name or whatever the case may be. And what that shows is that, is that closeness. It shows that connectivity that you have with that child or with that grandchild. And so he says here, my little children, I am writing this to you that you may not sin. So what we see right off the bat is that John, his desire for the group of people that he's writing to and ultimately church, God's desire for us is that we not sin, right? That's, that's the goal, that's the desire, that's what God wants for us, but we know that it's not the reality. We know that we are going to sin. I don't know about anybody else, but I don't wake up in the morning and look at my to-do list on my calendar and say, okay, yep, I'm gonna schedule in sin right here. So nine o'clock sounds like a good time. 1.15 right after lunch, that's good. 3.30, why not? Let's sneak one more in there. And then, hey, why not? 8.30, let's, let's send one more time before the day's over, right? Like, I, like, I don't schedule it into my day, but because we are imperfect, because we are fallen people, we know that sin is inevitable for us. We know we're going to sin. So when we do sin, what do we do next? What happens? What, what needs to be the next step in the process? You know, do we throw ourselves a pity party and say, well, I sinned, I guess the day is over now, it's ruined, right? Or, or, or do we live out all the days of our lives just defeated and guilt-ridden because we sinned? Do we say the right prayer and make things right? Or do we just quit altogether and say, well, I can't do this Jesus thing, so I'm just done because I can't stop sinning. You know, Pastor Brooks gave us his first last week, and, and John said it in here. First John uh, chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which is a great promise for us if we confess those sins. But I love also what he says here in verse 1 of chapter 2 that we just read. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Church, this morning we need to know that we have an advocate, and his name is Jesus. And now that may not mean a whole lot to you. You may say, oh, cool, we've got an advocate. That's great. You know, what does that even mean? I'm not really that excited about it. Well, let's see if I can change your mind. Here's what an advocate is. Here's, here's two quick definitions of an advocate. The first one is one who is called alongside to help, to support, or to intercede. The second definition that you could tie to advocate is this, a person who works and argues in support of another's cause. Jesus is your advocate. An advocate is someone who speaks on your behalf. An advocate is for you. And I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful that I don't have to defend myself because my Savior Jesus defends me for me. Because I know that I couldn't do a good enough job. I know that I wouldn't have the right words. I know that I wouldn't be able to figure it out. But he is my advocate. He does that for me. You know, really this whole idea, this whole uh, picture of an advocate really paints the picture for us of a courtroom. And so I don't know how much you've been in or out of a courtroom. That's your personal life, not for me to know. Uh, you know, maybe you've seen them on TV. Maybe you've seen them in movies. I don't know, right? But if you can imagine a courtroom, this is the picture that's being painted here for us. And God the Father is the righteous judge in this courtroom. He is the one seated high that has all authority to lay down the law because he is the righteous judge. Also in this same courtroom, Jesus is our defense attorney in this picture. He is our advocate. He is our defense attorney. Now, again, I've never personally had a defense attorney myself, so I don't know how it really works. But from what I understand in human terms, if you're a good defense attorney, you are going to plea the innocence of your client. You are going to make sure that you paint them in the best light possible. They, they are great. They're the best person that's ever walked this earth. They did all this community service. They feed the poor stray cats behind Taco Bell. They do all these things, right? They are an amazing person. I don't know where that came from. I don't even like cats. Sorry. <laughs> but listen, they're an amazing person. They're innocent. Like, they are the best. And they're going to make sure that they look completely innocent. What we have to understand is that when it comes to Jesus, our advocate, it's the opposite. Jesus admits our guilt. Right? There's, there's no going around it. He admits our guilt, but then, don't miss this, he admits our guilt, but then he enters a plea on our behalf as the one who made the atoning sacrifice that sets us free. So what happens is in this courtroom, Jesus says, listen, they're guilty. <laughs> there's no way around it. 
They are 100% guilty of everything you are bringing against them. They're, they're guilty. But he says, but, but this, but they're with me. And because they're in me, because they are with me, everything that you are accusing them of, they are acquitted of all of those charges because they are in me. Jesus is our advocate. I kind of feel like it's show and tell a little bit with you guys today, but I brought this rock with me. I told Pastor Brooks in the first service, this was for anybody that falls asleep, so I could just... <laughs> used to play baseball back in the day, so I, I think I got a few ligaments left in the shoulder, all right? But no, I, I brought this rock because uh, for four years, my wife and I served at a church in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I was a student pastor there. And uh, as we served there, uh, we had two pieces of property. We had the main church property, and then we had an eight-acre piece of property right next door, right across the street that was mostly wooded, but the front acre was cleared, and we had an old blue house in there, built in the 1930s, um, old blue house. We were called Blue House Youth because we're super creative, and we meet in an old blue house, right? So we'd meet in this blue house, and uh, the thing you have to understand about South Carolina is it's not Florida, so in the wintertime, it gets cold there, which is why I no longer live there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it gets cold there. And what happened was, is one of the years that we were there, they had the worst winter storm come through in 10 years. The, the worst storm came through. It was snowing. It was ice. We lost power because so much ice had built up on the power lines that they got too heavy, so they snapped and fell off of the power poles. And so for about four days, we were kind of just stuck in this, this winter storm, which was miserable for me because I like warmth, right? And so we're, we're there. And so what happened is at some point during this winter storm, after things got cleared, I went back to the church to go back to work, and I stopped in at the Blue House first to make sure that everything was good there because we were starting a new week and youth was going to be Wednesday night. So I just wanted to check in. And as I walked in, I saw this rock first laying on the floor of the Blue House, which I thought was odd. So I moved the curtain behind uh, where it looked like the direction that had maybe come to see that there was a broken window. So we can figure that somebody had thrown this through the window to check to see if we had an alarm. And then as I walked through the rest of the house, it was very clear to me that somebody had had a heyday in there for the last three or four days during this winter storm. Terrible, you know, we lost some things. It's a student ministry. We don't have anything of that much value. But some things got stolen, some things got taken, some things got damaged. So we clean it all up. Our property and grounds guys fix the windows. Everything's great. Well, seven days after that day, we had another winter storm come through. So the next day, it wasn't too bad. We could actually go to work. I drove back behind our blue house, back behind the property before I went to the church office. And as I did so, I saw the exact same window broken again. So in my head, I thought, oh my goodness, you, you've got to be kidding me. So I, I go and I get my pastor because I'm like, hey, we need to go in here and check it out. But just in case there's more than one guy, I mean, I think I can take one guy, but more than one guy, you know, I don't know. So I need some backup, you know, just in case. So I go and I get him, we go into the blue house, and this could be a whole sermon in and of its own, but we won't go through it all, but we ended up catching the person that had broken in. And, and it turned out that it was a 13-year-old boy that had broken in. We didn't know him, he wasn't connected to our ministry, but he had broken in uh, for a second time into our blue house. I guess he knew where he could find candy and Dr. Pepper and said, man, this is a good spot, right? So he was in there, we call the police, they come, they arrest him, they take him off, they do all these things. We fix all of our stuff. I don't really think about it a whole lot for about another month or two. And I get a letter in the mail at the church that's a court summons for me to come and to testify against this young man. So you have to understand, I, I get this letter. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, I, I'll, I'll go and I want to just tell the judge, listen, man, he's 13. Like, he, he just messed up. I wanted somewhere warm for the night. You know, whatever. Let, let's give him some grace. Like, I thought I was going to go in there and be, you know, the savior of the day, if you will. As I get there and I get up to the third floor where this court hearing is supposed to take place, I get to this hallway that is just slammed full of people. And I'm thinking, holy cow, like what is going on? So I ask this gentleman as I walk up, I'm like, hey, what are you guys here for? And he said, oh, we're here for a court hearing for, and he said the kid's name. And I thought, e everybody? And he said, yeah, everybody. So it turns out that this young man had been on quite the crime spree for a couple of weeks and had broken into houses and cars and stolen stuff from stores and just was just a terrible situation. So at that point, I'm like, well, I'm not saying anything, not because I don't want the kid to have grace, but just, you know, there's so many people, who knows what all is going to happen. So we go into this courtroom, we go in for this hearing, and I tell you all of this to, to land on this point. We get to the very end, all the charges have been brought against the young man, and at the very end, they ask for the mom to come and approach the stand, uh, and they're going to ask her some questions. 
And I found out at this point during this court hearing that this young man had been adopted by this woman and her husband, and that this whole crime spree had started about two years ago. It started very simply with like stealing candy from the gas station and just simple things like that and had escalated to some, some severe stuff. And as I'm in this courtroom listening to this mom, this last standing advocate that this young man has, one of the saddest things I've ever witnessed in my life happened. He said, well, ma'am, you adopted this kid when he was seven years old. He's 13 now. You know, all of this has gone on. What, what, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want me to do? This is the judge talking to the mom. And she said, sir, we've had him for six years. We've had two kids of our own since then. It's, he's just trouble. He doesn't want to listen. I'm scared for our lives. I'm scared for his life. I think the best thing for me to do today is to relinquish my, parent, my parental rights. And I'm turning him back over to the state for you guys to do whatever you feel like is necessary with this young man. Now, I tell you that not because I want to shame the mother because she did what she thought that she needed to do. But what we have to understand is that in this moment, this young man's last standing advocate that he had besides the state of South Carolina said, you know what? I can't handle this anymore. He's your problem now. And so I tell you that to tell you this, church, I'm so thankful that Jesus, our Savior, our advocate, doesn't look at us in the middle of our mess and say, nope, they've gone too far this time. Nope, they've messed up. Nope, they've stepped out too far. They've definitely out grace this time. You know what? You just take them and do whatever you want with them. No, our Savior, our advocate, our defender, Jesus, does the exact opposite, and he continues to be our advocate even in the middle of some of our messy situations. Church, you have to understand that we have an advocate that is faithful. We have an advocate that is true. We have an advocate that is who he says he is and that does what he says he'll do, and he says that he loves you and that he will never leave you and he'll never forsake you. No matter how far you've gone, it's not too late to turn around and to come back. He is our advocate, and his name is Jesus. But here's what you have to understand. Please don't miss this. Jesus wants to be your advocate, church, but before he can be your advocate, he has to first be your savior. You can't advocate for somebody that you don't know, and he wants to know you in a real and personal way. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I would pray that right now, right here in this room, maybe at invitation time, that you would go from death to life, that you would say, I need an advocate named Jesus, but first I need him to be my savior. And I need to follow him all the days of my life. So number one, we have an advocate. Number two, we find in Jesus our righteousness. Number two, our righteousness. Verse one there says, as we we just read, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Righteous or righteousness is a word that we hear a lot in church. We hear it a lot. We read it a lot. We sing it a lot. Maybe we even say it in conversations a lot. You would say that this is part of our Christian language that we call Christianese, right? We use it all the time. Why? Because righteousness is important. But the thing that we have to understand is that we are not righteous. We as humans are not righteous, at least not on our own. Some of us may be self-righteous, but that's not helping anybody, including ourselves, right? It helps when we have a proper understanding of the word righteousness. Let's give a definition to this. It's a very simple definition. Righteousness simply means this, to be in right standing with God. If you are righteous, if you have righteousness, you are in right standing with God. And don't miss that the only way, the only way that we can be in right standing with God is to be found in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can achieve righteousness. As a matter of fact, Colossians 3 Verses one through four says this. It says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So when we are in Christ, when he becomes Lord and Savior of our life, our life is now hidden in him. We are in Jesus Colossians 3 goes on to say, and then when Jesus is revealed, then we will be revealed also. So we have to understand that righteousness is not ours alone. It's not us. It's Jesus's righteousness. It's when our life is hidden in him, his righteousness covers our unrighteousness, which then makes us righteous before the sight of the Lord. It's his righteousness that makes us righteous, which which turns into this. When God the Father looks at us, He no longer sees us, but he sees our life hidden in his son, Jesus, and he sees righteousness. He sees right standing before him. 
2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it this way. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. So again, it's through Jesus, through him taking on our sins, through him and his finished work on the cross, and only through him that we can achieve righteousness with the Father. It's his name that brings about righteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm pretty sure this is true of most of us in the room. We realize, we understand that certain names grant us access to certain places and to certain people, right? Like, I don't know, you know, maybe you get pulled over for not stopping all the way to a stop sign. And I know that you do this. When you get pulled over before the police officer can make it to the car, you start thinking, okay, what city am I in? Where am I at? What police officers do I know that work in the city? So I can call them and say, hey, your buddy pulled me over. Call him and tell him to stop, right? Don't lie. You've been there. I've done it before, right? You know? Or maybe you go to a restaurant and you're like, hey, I'm going to get a discount or I'm going to get some free bread or whatever. So you name drop the manager that you kind of loosely know and say, hey, how's Roger and the kids? You guys seen him in the store recently, you know? And you name drop that name. You know, unashamedly, I'll, I'll tell you, I name drop. I don't have a problem doing it, right? We had our baby three weeks ago and we went to Waterman Hospital, which we, which we love. You know, we grew up here, so we've been to Waterman a few times in our lifetime. And as we go to Waterman, they've got this newer labor and delivery floor, and it's amazing. And all the nurses there are great, and the floor is great, and all the stuff's new technology. It's, it's awesome. And so we get there, and we're, we're getting, uh, you know, kind of all situated, and we, and we meet our nurse, and, uh, you know, we're talking to her. And I just, I just name-dropped. I was like, hey. I was like, um, do you know so-and-so? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's the head nurse over this whole floor. And I was like, yeah, that's right. And I was like, I... I I know her. And she's like, oh, you do? And I said, yeah. I said, um, I've known her since I was in about fourth grade. Um, she's, she's my best friend's mom, and she's like a second mom to me. And, all, and I was like, so treat me good, right? You know, so take care of us. They didn't need that to treat us good. But, you know, you got to name drop every once in a while, right? Like, I know for me, like, depending on what part of Lake County I'm in or what I'm trying to accomplish, man, I name drop. I'm like, hey, yeah, I'm Chase. Uh, you know, I'm on staff with Brooks Braswell at First Baptist Church in Matilla. And I name drop that joker. I don't care, right? Or depending on what part of Lake County I'm in, if I'm in a different part, then I say, yeah, my name's Chase Allen. I'm on staff with Mike Ellis, executive pastor at First Baptist Church. And that gives me access to some certain things, right? So we understand how this, how this works. You know, for my wife and I, uh, we've been in student ministry for just over 10 years. We're, we're approaching 11 years, which I don't know if that makes us like veterans or getting old and the 13-year-olds are going to kick us out of the room soon. I have no idea. But we've been doing this for a while. And so what's happened over the years is that a lot of our date nights kind of turn into this. It's like, hey, I got a babysitter. Like, let's go get some Chick-fil-A, right? Cookies and cream milkshakes and all included, right? Maybe peach if it's the right season for all my peach milkshake people, right? And, and we go and we get some Chick-fil-A. And then it's like, hey, uh, so-and-so has a volleyball game tonight or a basketball game or a football game. And we end up going to uh, students' games. It's changed a little bit since we have, you know, little ones now. It makes it a little bit harder. But, you know, we, we often go to games, and so I'll never forget a couple football seasons ago, uh, we were going to go to our very first Apopka High School football game, right? Very first one, and we were excited about it. And so we, we get ready, we go eat, uh, and we get, we're getting ready to go to the game. And if you know anything about Apopka High School football, they're kind of good, and so they're kind of like a big deal. So people go to the games. Like, I mean, like a lot of people go to the games. So you got to get there early so you can find parking and you can get a seat all this kind of stuff, and so we're, we're there, and we're driving around, and I'm not super familiar with their campus, so I'm just kind of like driving in circles trying to find parking, and one thing that you have to understand about me is like I'm all about free parking, right? So like I don't want to pay five dollars. Come on, there's, there's got to be free parking somewhere, right? Granted, we were already getting into the game for free because we were on the list, and it was great. You know, we were, we were high rolling that night, right? But, you know, so I'm trying to find free parking, and we can't find anything anywhere, and so we finally drive around to this one street, and I see this guy standing in front of a gate that's closed, but behind him, like, the football field is right there. And I noticed that the buses that I'm guessing were from the away team, they were there. And then I see some, like, coaches and coaches' wives parking. I'm like, that's where we're going to park. This is it. This is going to be great. So we drive up to the gate, and we get up to the guy, super friendly guy. And he's like, hey, he's like, what can I do for you? Are you a coach? And I was like, no, not, not a coach. He's like, well, what do you need? And I was like, well, I'm trying to find parking. And Shelly Darlington told me it was okay if I park here. Now, if you know the Darlingtons at all, they came to this church for a lot of years before they moved to Enterprise, and Shelly's going to kill me later for, for knowing, well, she knew that I did that, but for saying it here in front of the whole church. But I name-dropped Shelly Darlington. Why? Because her husband's the football coach. 
of the varsity team. So if I say the name Darlington, I know I got to be granted access to park in this parking lot. And sure enough, he let me park there. We texted Shelly, told her where we were, because she was coming to meet us at the gate. And she's like, you parked where? She's like, I'm not even allowed to park there. Like, it was, it was great. Like, it was awesome. And so we got this access because of the name that I was able to drop. And so what I want us to understand, what I want us to grasp is this, that in Jesus' name, we have access to some things that we don't deserve. In Jesus' name, we are granted some things that we shouldn't be getting, but we get anyways as a benefit of being a son or a daughter of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we get access to forgiveness of sins. We get access to life and life more abundantly. We get access to eternity in heaven with the Father. We get access to the Father himself through Jesus Christ. Why? Because he is our righteousness. And if we'll give our lives to him, our life will be hidden in him and we will be righteous before the Lord. So number one, we have an advocate. Number two, we find our righteousness. And then number three, we have the propitiation. The propitiation. If you need spelling, it's up on the screen. (laughs) Verse two says this, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. So John here tells us that Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. Other translations will read it very differently. It'll say it this way. It'll say Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, or another translation says it this way, Jesus is the sacrifice that takes away sin. I kind of like that because when we read that, and we know that John, who wrote 1 John, also wrote the, wrote the Gospel of John, we know that John 1, says this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is John quoting John the Baptist here in this moment. There's a lot of Johns in the Bible, right? John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's ministering to people. He's baptizing. He's getting people ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. And as he's doing so, Jesus himself, his cousin, comes walking down the road. He stops everything and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Why would he do that? Because Jesus is the propitiation. Let me give you one last definition for the day. Propitiation can simply be defined as this. It is a sacrifice that satisfies. A sacrifice that satisfies, which is why it's so important because we've talked about this before, but we have to understand and constantly remember that under the Old Testament law, they had a sacrificial system put in place that made a way for the forgiveness of their sins. And so all throughout this sacrificial system, different people in the nation of Israel would have to come and present their sacrifices to get their sins washed away. Bulls, rams, goats, doves, whatever the case may be for whatever it was that they had going on in their life, they had to make these sacrifices. So they would come to the temple and they would present their sacrifice to the priest. And the priest would prepare the sacrifice. He'd kill the sacrifice. He'd sprinkle the blood on the altar. He'd burn the offering for the person. And then therefore your worship was done and you were forgiven of your sins for the time being. And it's at this moment we're all thankful that we live in 2020 in a New Testament church and you're not bringing your sacrifices to the stage today, right? So we have to understand that this was the system that was in place. Constantly having to make a sacrifice to make up and to cover your sins. And then once a year, the nation of Israel would have this day that we call the Day of Atonement. And I know that we've talked about this before, but I want to talk about a different side of it than maybe the last time that I shared this from the stage. They had the Day of Atonement, in which the high priest, he had a full day. I'm not going to go through the entire list. You're going to feel like I'm going through the entire list, but it's just half of it. Here's what the high priest day looked like. He'd have to get up, and he'd cleanse himself to be ready for the Day of Atonement. He'd put on fresh, clean, new robes. He'd then make a sacrifice on his behalf for himself, for his sins. He would then make a sacrifice on behalf of all the other priests in the temple and their sins. He would then move from there and make another sacrifice for all of the people of the nation of Israel. He would then from there go and he would take incense and he would make this cloud in front of the Holy of Holies, which remember only the high priest could enter into. And he would go in with the blood from the sacrifices and he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. This only happened one time a year. Then as he leaves, as he exits the Holy of Holies, he then has to cleanse the entire temple. And you're thinking he's exhausted at this point, which I would think so, right? He'd cleanse the whole temple. And then as he'd get done cleansing the temple, the list would go on and on and on throughout the entire day. So what we have to understand is that as this Day of Atonement came around, this was a big deal. Not because it was a celebration for the nation of Israel. It was actually the exact opposite. This is described as a very somber day. 
a day where the nation of Israel was called to humble themselves, to mourn their sins, to reflect on who and where they were. There was also to be observed with a Sabbath, meaning that no work was to be done. They were to just sit and to think about how terrible they are, really, is what they were doing. And it's this day that would come around every year on the 10th day of the seventh month. And I tell you that to get to this point right here. As part of the Day of Atonement, one of the very last things that the high priest would do is he would make one final atonement for all of the sins, for all of the nation of Israel. And it's so good that I just want to read it to you. It's Leviticus 16, verses 20 through 22. Leviticus 16, 20 through 22, it says this. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay down both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all of their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness and by the hand of the man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land and he shall release the goat into the wilderness." This goat, this atonement is what we would call the scapegoat. The, all of the sins, all the iniquities, all of the transgressions of the nation of Israel would be placed on this goat. And he'd be sent out never to return again. As a matter of fact, Jewish tradition would say this. The goat was taken 10 miles out of Jerusalem. And there were refreshment stations at each mile along the way for the man who escorted the goat out of the city. He finally went the 10 miles and then watched the goat wander off until he could not see it anymore. Then, only then, the sin of Israel was gone and the day of atonement was considered complete. So as we say that, as we read that, as we think about that, think about this. This perfectly demonstrates for us how under the Old Testament law, this sacrificial system was never complete because of this. They could put the sin away. They could send the sin out of town, but the sin was never eliminated. As long as the goat was alive and wandering through the desert and through the wilderness, the sin was still alive. It just wasn't in the forefront of their minds. It wasn't in their midst. And I would have to think that for me, if I was an Israelite, I would be so worried that I don't care if you took him 30 miles out of town. What if the goat came back? Like, what if he re-entered the city and then all of a sudden the goat who carried away our sins is back in our midst? What does that mean and what are we supposed to do? It wasn't a complete system. So why does all of that matter? A couple of reasons, and then we'll finish up. First is that we know that the sacrificial system was not sustainable. This system that was in place was not something that was sustainable because you were constantly making sacrifices to cover for your sins. For some of us, that may be a lot of sacrifices. For others of us, it may be a few, but regardless, constantly making sacrifices. You were consistently carrying the guilt and the shame and the weight of those sins around with you between sacrifice to sacrifice. That sin would constantly be at the forefront of your mind. And not only that, what I feel like is probably most important for us to, to realize and to grasp is this, is that while you were making those sacrifices, making a sacrifice like that was kind of like putting a Band-Aid on a cut that goes all the way down to the bone. It may help it for a second or for a minute or for a moment, but it's never going to properly heal and it's never going to take care of the issue that's at hand. The sin is going to continue to abound. That's the first reason it's important to know. The second reason is this. The second reason is that we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill it, not to do away with it, to fulfill the law so that it was no longer necessary. And you have to understand that Jesus is similar to the scapegoat and that he took on all the sin and all the shame. But this time, thank the Lord, it wasn't a temporary fix. And it wasn't just for the nation of Israel because when Jesus took on all the sin, it was all sin for all people for all time. He took it all on for us. And he said, once and for all. Because here's what it says in verse 2. He says, and not for our sins only, but for those of the whole world. So when Jesus takes on the sin and the shame and the guilt and all the things that he took on, it's for everyone for all time. I continue to say, because this continues to form me, that when Jesus died on the cross for my sins and for yours, every single one of our sins were future to him. He knew every sin we were ever going to commit, but yet he still died for us anyways. He bared all the sin, all the shame. And Jesus was the first 
and the very last sacrifice that satisfied. Because once he fulfills the law, the sacrificial system is no longer needed because he says, it is finished. That's why when he's on the cross, he says, to tell us that, which means it is finished. It's done. It's paid for. It's covered. There's nothing else that needs to happen. It's yours. So this morning, church, I don't know what you're looking for in life. I don't know spiritually what you're looking for, but look no further than Jesus. You need to know this. If you've never accepted it and began to walk it out before, you need to know that there's a God who loves you enough that he sent his son Jesus from heaven to earth, right? Wrapped himself in human flesh, was humbled to the point that he would be a baby born in a barn. He lived a perfect life for 33 years, sinless. He did that just to, just to be put to death on a criminal's cross to bear my sins and to bear your sins. He would borrow a grave, as we sung earlier, for three days just to rise again to be triumphant over sin and over death so that nobody could ever say that victory comes in any other name other than Jesus. And so if you want an advocate, if you want to be righteous, if you want to be in right standing with God, if you want to, to, to wrap your arms around the propitiation, the sacrifice that satisfies, look no further than Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I would implore you to listen to the Spirit as he works and moves in your life. Maybe you're here and you know that you need to make that decision. Maybe you sat through sermon after sermon, message after message like this, and you've never taken that step that you know you've needed to take. If that's you today, I pray that you would be bold, that you would step out, that you would say, look, I can't do this thing called life on my own. I need the Savior. I need Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've got other stuff going on in your life. Maybe you just need prayer. I would love to pray with you. The altar will be open. Whatever it is that you need to do today, my prayer is this, that you would handle your business with God today. Let today be the day of salvation. Let's pray.